Welcome to Energy Stew. This is Peter Roth, your host. And I'd like to ask you, are you a traveler? <laughs> How much do you travel? How far beyond your own mind, your own conscious mind, do you go? And some of us are very fortunate that we can explore other consciousness, other aspects of our consciousness. And one of the masters, I believe, of that, because he's somebody who I have a tremendous regard for as a, a, an incredible traveler and has written many books on it. I actually attended a workshop he gave in New York many years ago and traveled in that workshop to wonderful places. So, so let's talk with the author of a new book called Mysterious Realities, Robert Moss. Robert, welcome to Energy Stew. Good to be on the roads of the many worlds with you, Peter. <laughs> oh my gosh. You, you, in this book alone, you explore so many worlds that I couldn't put the book down. Every page was another opportunity to understand the nature of our greater mind, of the opportunity that we have to live in different consciousness that you have explored through your whole life, starting when you were, I believe, three years old, right? Yeah, I love your questing spirit, Peter. Thank you for that nice warm up. Yeah, when I was three, I'm in a Hobart hospital, Tasmania, Australia, and the doctors pronounced me clinically dead. Then I come back and they say to my parents with a little, little surprise and embarrassment, oh, your boy died and he came back, didn't he? So, you know, I had that experience at three. I can't tell you much about what happened to me at that stage. I just know it's awfully hard to operate the body in ordinary reality afterwards, but very easy to get out of it. When I was nine, it happened again. I'm under an emergency appendectomy under the surgeon's knife in a hospital in Melbourne. I'm pronounced clinically dead. But in fact, I'm traveling in another world where I find a beautiful race of rather pale, elegant people who raised me as their own and I become a father, grandfather, have a full and satisfying life and then I die to that life and I'm bang, I'm back in the body of a nine-year-old kid in a hospital room. And of course, how do you talk about this to people in a conservative environment in that time back in Australia in the 1950s? The first person I met who could make any sense of this was an Aboriginal kid from indigenous culture. And I told him my stories. Oh, yeah, we do that. We get sick. We go and live with the spirits, don't we? When we get well, we come back. Sometimes we're the same. Sometimes we're not. So to cut to the chase, because of these childhood experiences, I've never had much difficulty, Peter, in traveling beyond the obvious reality, traveling to other worlds. I have always known that for me, there are worlds beyond the physical, worlds where the dead are alive, parallel universes, and so on. And that's what the new book is all about. And, and your other books have really explored these other realms, these what you call imaginal realms, but we have to understand that our imagination is not just fantasy, even though it appears fantastic. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, the use of the term, the description, imaginal is an effort to reclaim the value of imagination because we have this terrible habit of saying it's just my imagination it's only imagination shrugging it off as idle fantasy whereas in fact mystics shamans poets creators in every field have always understood there are realms in non-ordinary reality where you get the good stuff. There are places you want to go because they're places of innovation, places of creative breakthrough. There are schools, there are temples, there are places of initiation and healing. There are places where the intelligent dead are alive and accessible. And all of those places can be called generically the imaginal realm. It's a realm between time and eternity. You step outside linear time, go to that realm, you can step back into different points in time, past, prep, future, or parallel. But this is a book of stories. It's not a book of theory. I have models of understanding for these things, but I wanted to give people the adventures. I'm following the logic of the griffin in Alice in Wonderland. You might remember the mock turtle and the griffin are talking on a beach. They're discussing whether you should first have the adventure or the discussion. And the griffin says, First, the adventure, later the discussion. Discussions take such a very long time. So this is a book of adventures. Oh, my gosh. The adventures in this book are so captivating. I love it. And speaking of, of going back through time, you're, you're also an, an archaeological dreamer, and you actually yes. travel on uh, these journeys, archaeological journeys, with others. 
and you chose a couple of people to go back to uh, check out Carl Jung. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's in this book, <laughs> and uh, and to understand Jung's nature and his imaginal realm and how he depended on that to open up worlds of understanding to him. Yeah, that's the story of the book called The Other Bollingen. Bollingen is is the name of the village near Jung's sanctuary on the lake, which he generally called the tower. He built himself the sanctuary on Lake Zurich. And I knew from reading the biographies, I love Jung, I've always loved Jung. I'm not a Jungian, but I've always loved Jung. Jung wasn't a Jungian either, but I've always understood that this Bollingen was very important to him. I learned from Barbara Hanner, an analyst who lived very close to Jung, that before he died, he started dreaming of his home on the other side of death, and he called it the other Bollingen. Those dreams caused him to have no fear of death. Well, I found myself spontaneously while leading a group journey for helpful and timely communication with people on the other sides of death. That's the kind of thing that I do. I found myself spontaneously in conversation with Jung. The full story is in the story. And it was so interesting. I mean, I saw what his afterlife situation might be like. I saw the book he considers his master work that he's been composing since he died. It's a purple book, not the red book. It's called The Book of Heaven. The title of the introduction is Why I Am Not a Jungian. My Jungian friends reading this story will be inflamed probably. But anyway, I'm crazy enough to think that I could invite a couple of people in one of my gatherings to travel with me back to the other Bollingen and see if we could get together some more information from Jung. We had a varied reception, but all of, this, all of this brought stuff back, and it's all in the story, and it's a just-so story. In other words, Peter, it's not fiction. It might read like fiction, but it is just exactly what happened. The first contact, and then the effort to go back and get more from Jung in his possible location on the other side of death. And, well, so much in, in your work has to do with traveling archaeologically. So you're actually going to places that existed in real time, yes. interviewing people and understanding conditions that archaeologists now are searching for, and you're having a direct experience of that. Yes, I do that in various places in the world. I mean, the book, as you'll see, is a book of travels in ordinary reality as well as non-ordinary reality. But some of the places are rich and strange. I mean, some of the stories are set in Transylvania, where I teach every year, by the way. I teach in Transylvania. Why not? It's a great place to do this stuff. But one of the stories is set in and around the ancient city of Ephesus, city of the great goddess. And I have a rather humiliating and embarrassing episode there, which results in me being bitten by a wild boar. I'm probably the only guest you'll ever talk to, or only man you'll ever talk to, is literally been bitten by a wild boar. That happened. But and it unfolded explain, in a storm. Let's explain in, that. It's wild boars. The energy fight of people. An goddess. Who gets bitten by a wild boar? Not tusked, fortunately, just bitten. Just bitten. It was rather dramatic. I made a cavalier remark in the presence of a breathing image, a statue of the great goddess, and I was punished for it right away, and I had to make amends. This is an example of living on the mythic edge and needing to be aware that, you know, if you're really one of those mythopoeic characters who is very close to the big stories, you better be careful how you comport yourself. So it's an embarrassing, wildly funny story about an encounter with one of the most terrifying forms of the great goddess at an ancient site in Anatolia, which the Greeks used to call I Ionia. You have to know the, the rules of respect in these other realms, and you weren't respecting this goddess enough, and this wild boar took exception to that, because as you explain in the book, it's, it's a place where there are a lot of wild bo boars who have never bitten anybody. And you came along, That's right. and because you right. needed to find out how wrong you were about the, treating the goddess this way, you actually surprised everybody by having this um, tragedy. That exactly. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a tragedy. It might have been a tra tragedy if I had been facing the other way around. It bit me in the back, <laughs> but in the second <laughs> chakra. And, and it could have been much worse, Peter. And the story is just how it played out. It's just lightly fictionalized at the end where I have a professor who's an aspect of myself telling me, you're someone who's always getting into mythic trouble. That's the only fictional element. That's me talking to myself. And the, the boar is a form of the goddess, the form of the goddess in her wrath, in her rage, in many ancient traditions. And it's an animal I've had some interesting encounters with in different uh, literal settings in this world. So it's a book of travels and ordinary reality, but what we discover as we read it is the gates to the other world open from wherever you are. And the stories that accompany you, the archetypes in, term, in the, the term that Jung used, are always part of the story. Jung once said, 
we travel with a circumambient atmosphere around us, not just our personal energy field of thoughts and feelings and history, but our connections with the archetypes, with the gods, goddesses, with the spirits, with the bigger stories. I know that to be true. I know as I travel in life, I'm traveling with certain stories beyond my own personal story, and they generate certain synchronistic effects. So it's also a book about synchronicity, those special moments in life when you know time just altered and something came poking through the curtains of our ordinary understanding to show us more of the secret order of events. Right. You're a real ambassador of a multidimensional universe. <laughs> and, and so what's fascinating, there are so many ways you look at this. For instance, you understood that you have to, in order to stay alive, you have to entertain death. <laughs> And provide. Yeah, you know, I often, I often, I often suggest to people they try and look at what, which of the never-ending stories they're living. I used to say Odysseus. And by the way, Odysseus was also struck by a boar. He was tusked, not bitten in the back. I did better than Odysseus. But these days, when days when people say, "What story do you think you're living?" from mythology, from literature, Robert, I say Scheherazade. Scheherazade in the Arabian Nights has to come up with a new story every night, or else she's dead. And the opening story in Mysterious Realities is, again, just so experienced from my life, I have a close-up personal meeting with a personified death who takes the form of Yama, who's well known to Hindus and Buddhists. He can be terrifying. He can be a smoking mountain, a sort of meat-eating machine, terrifying. Or he can be like a Maharaj or ed ed educated Oxbridge, very nice accent, very civilized way of talking. But my encounters with him. I always have to submit to him placing his noose around my neck. You know, in the mythology, Yama takes the soul out of the body with a noose. I always have to submit to letting him put my death, put his noose around my neck. Then we can have a talk. So the, the collection starts and is framed by the idea, here's a guy, here's an author, who's allowed to live as long as he keeps producing some good stories, good enough to entertain death. And I find it juicy. I find it, you know, stimulating, actually. To think that this is my story and maybe some others will recognize it too. Right and maybe we should all understand our stories better to make sure we 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 have a continuity in our lives that is respected <laughs> by death. <laughs> I I actually think that it's a very good thing to have a personal relationship with death. You can regard this as fantasy or personal mythology if you like. I don't. I mean, I have a, I've had a very close relationship with death all my life. I know as a matter of experience, not theology, that there is life beyond death, and that has shaped my attitudes for everything, for, towards everything for as long as I can remember. I think that if you have that view of life, you might do better. You might find you have certain courage and clarity. The relationship with death brings you and you're thinking about a larger order of values and you're thinking about your story as it will look when you're somewhere else anyway but i'm not theological about this this is just my experience my experience is that life that soul consciousness survives death and that's something worth thinking about and worth acting from oh i totally am with you on that and uh, explore the other side in my own uh, abilities that i have to do that uh, but not as a dream traveler so much as I'm more, let's say, cerebral about it and my mind opens to receiving a lot of information uh, in great detail that is really astounding to me that um, what I hear and what I know from the other side. Um, yes. So, um, I, I, but there's so much in your book that's so entertaining uh, considering, you know, a little part about the man in the moon. <laughs> yes, yes, the man in the moon, the daemon of Luna, conversation with him. Well, you know, the ancient belief is that we transit the realm of Luna. It's actually in the Judeo-Christian tradition too. Gabriel is in some verse an archangel of the moon and a, a patron of dreaming and astral travel, and one of those who presides over and protects the spirits traveling to and from the astral realm of the moon. Plutarch, one of my favorites, who is a priest of Apollo as well as a famous philosopher and biographer, he wrote a couple of treatises on the spirits that live in the realm of the moon. And he said, basically, this is where your soul goes after death if you're on the right track and it's a way that you find your way to a body coming from somewhere else i'm crazy enough or old-fashioned enough to think that this is possibly fairly accurate 
about how things work on these planes. Anyway, but it's not a book of theory. I have an interview with a spirit who lives in the realm of the moon. He's been living there for a long time. He's not exactly human. He gives us a picture of the traffic that goes on back and forth in the astral realm of Luna. What happens to astral bodies when you're traveling after death through the realm of the moon? What are dangers and confusions and delusions in this field of activity? And then there's a companion story really called uh, at, at the Moon Cafe, which is about a mother and daughter who make an arrangement to meet each other in a designed environment, a created environment in the astral realm of the Moon. And that is based on the experience of a beautiful mother and daughter who came to my workshops and set up an arrangement to see each other after the mother died. And have gone on doing it in precisely this way. Mom now has a lovely cottage, has a lovely garden, there's a nice cafe where they can drink something better than champagne or have tea and cakes. So that story is taken from the experience of people I've worked closely with. Right, and I think what is very important about your work for, for everyone uh, who can imagine the great stories that, that you bring to it, to know that there is a universe of incredible color, of, of opportunity. Uh, let's talk about even what senses we can experience on the other side. Because uh, a lot of us have no idea. The other side, oh, if you don't have your body, then you can't see or breathe or whatever because you've left your body behind. So what, what is there? You know, and you, you know, it's a, it's, I always try to tell people that uh, the world out there is much more exciting than the world here in, <laughs> in, in more, in, in better ways, only because we have more opportunity to use our imagination versus on this plane that we're living in, uh, we're oppressed by our limited minds. And yes. I think the last bit is very true. Certainly the geography of the world of imagination the world of multidimensional reality is much richer and vaster than the geography of this earth, even though there's so much on this earth for us to explore that most of us don't know about yet. I mean, the play of the senses uh, after death or out of the body can be intense. It can be more intense than it is when you're in the physical body. I mean, in India, they talk about the karma body, K-A-M-A, -A, the desire body, and the fact that it survives death and it knows pleasure and pain more intensely, not less intensely than the physical body. You might know that in certain moments in this life, actually, when your body of desire is operating along your physical body. One of the things that we're not taught anymore in the West and our traditions have atrophied is that there are multiple vehicles of energy and consciousness that can operate beyond the body during life and survive it after death. We're not taught this. There's a high tradition of this in, in every spiritual lineage that knows its stuff, in Kabbalah, in, in Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophy, in India and China, all over the place, that there are multiple vehicles of energy and consciousness. As I understand it, it's like this, Peter. We die. There's a heavy energy vehicle close to the physical that survives death and it's meant to go into the earth, meant to go into the ground. You never want to confuse that with higher vehicles of intelligence or, or soul. And then there's an astral body, an astral spirit, if you like. We've heard more about that. That's the one that travels in dreams. I can have very vivid sensory you know, impressions. And it, it can live on for quite a long time. It's not eternal, but it can live, could survive the body for quite a long time. Then there are higher aspects of spirit or consciousness or mind with their own vehicles. Some of those vehicles have to be grown or uh, earned again after physical death. So once again, I mean, I'm not offering a theory here. I'm offering experiences from the roads of the many worlds about how this works. So you will feel accounts what go, you, you'll read accounts of what goes on to people living or surviving in these different vehicles of energy and consciousness. And even more than that, we're more than one person out there too. We, there are oh, yes, yes, yes. parallel lives. Yes. Yeah, this, this is, I find this subject terribly exciting. I mean, really thrilling actually. I mean, and, and there's a scientific basis for it or scientific analog. In physics, they talk, call it the many worlds interpretation of reality or some people now call it the many interactive worlds. In a nutshell, what it, physics is saying is we're living right now, you and I and everybody else, in one of uncountable parallel universes. The universe is splitting all the time. So there's another Peter who's not doing the radio show with me. There's one who took the phone call and held things up for another 15 minutes. There's a Robert who never became a dream teacher. There's certainly many Roberts who've died already and whose knowledge of the afterlife is more intimate than mine because they're living well or otherwise in afterlife location right now and so on and so on. 
two questions, which my book actually addresses without you know, polemicizing about it, just addresses them through stories. How do we know about this thing, this stuff first, firsthand? If there are many worlds, how do you know firsthand? And number two, can you do anything with this knowledge or is it just information? Well, we can learn about these things if we become more active dreamers in the sense of logging our dreams in our journals and looking as we read our journals at scenes which seem to reflect a continuous life going forward in parallel to our own. Jung became very interested in this towards the end of his life. Jung actually said, what I would agree with, we lead continuous lives in other realities and our dreams might be glimpses or memories of what is going on. So you can learn either by observing what's happening in your night dreams or by doing what I teach people to do by going consciously journeying to these parallel selves and tracking them, you see what's going on. Then you can do this, Peter. You can actually do this. You can try and sit down, have lunch or a drink or a cup of tea with a parallel self and see if you can do something for each oh, other. I've been doing that recently. <laughs> and I watched other people do Okay, you've done this. I didn't do that. Can you give me a tip? Can you slip me a few pages? That book I didn't write. Can you give me a connection I don't have? And I'll do this for you in return. So what I've come to now is deal making with parallel selves. Let's share something with each other. Let's see if we can do some good for each other. Why not? If you regard this as fantasy, I'd say it's wonderful, creative fantasy. But I think it actually works. And so many times in my dreams, I'm having adventures with people who I know so well, and yet I don't know them in this life. Right. And yet they're so close to me. And exploring places that I feel at home in and and very real to me. And and these are likely the parallel lives. Yes. Uh, and and so we don't, you know, we're not conscious that we're doing that, but the more like you and I are talking and people say, oh yeah, let, let me see, oh yes. And we so we can learn about ourselves so much more just by having yes. this perspective about our dream life. Yes. Well said. I agree with every word of that, and I'd add that there are also alternate lives in a different sense. I've come to the opinion that we are connected to dramas and stories being lived in other times, not just parallel lives, but past lives, future lives, lives of other personalities. I'm a bit of an agnostic about reincarnation, but I have the opinion that the dramas of our present lives do, you know, turn upon, to some extent, dramas being lived in other times. So we might find ourselves also in our dreams, in the life of someone who is not our present or parallel self, but is a different personality related to us within our multidimensional family operating in a different time. And from a certain point of view, it's all going on now. I mean, there's linear time, but it's a convenience. Einstein is very clear about that. Linear time is not a fundamental reality. It's a human convenience to stop things happening all at once. Go far enough with this and you might rise to the same opinion. And if you understand that it's always now in some sense, then you might understand you can slip into the situation of another self in another time, past or future. You can be observer or you might find yourself right inside it. Some of my stories and experiences are about that as well. See, what you're opening up is the opportunity to get beyond our, the linear limitation of our thought process, of our understanding of life. We have such a, a linear, limited mind in this dimension that we're, we're in here that we, we can't understand how vast uh, the understanding of time can be in so many ways that you explore in your books and we're stuck in this after this after that after that and you take us all over the place well a lot of this me is about waking up. I used to have a bumper sticker on my car when I still had a bumper sticker on my car which said, wake up and dream. I mean, for me, dreaming is not fundamentally about what happens during sleep. It's a, about waking up to a deeper order of events yeah. than we're aware of in our ordinary state. In our ordinary state, we're often like sleepwalkers. We're trying to get through the schedule. We're trying to fit in with people's expectations. We're trying to get the paycheck, etc. Dreaming, we wake up. And by dreaming now, I'm not just talking about sleep dreams or shamanic journeying or lucid dreaming. I'm also talking about about observing synchronicity. A lot of my stories and a lot of my life is actually spent being open to the play of those special moments where the world is speaking to you in a set of symbols, like a dream. Yeah. 
and noticing the opportunity in those moments. And sometimes you feel that time is working differently. I made up a word, Peter, chiromancy. Jung gave us the word synchronicity. It was a boring word. It just means things happening at the same time, which is not interesting. But it sounds scientific, so we all use it now. I made the word chiromancy for someone who gets really good at recognizing those special moments where the universe gets personal. Kairos was the Greek god of jump time, opportunity time. Not uh, tick-tock linear time, but jump time, opportunity time. Mansi is about divination. So if you become a chiromancer and you see in mysterious realities what that means on the roads of life, being available to opportunity, being available to mythic moments, you are forever poised to notice when time starts working differently, you feel a hidden hand, mind and matter weave together, and you do something with it. That is so perfect. And that's how we all have to handle every day living in the magic of this reality that operates at levels that we have no idea and right. just be open right. to how it arrives. Uh, we're getting near the end of the show. Uh, Robert Moss, I'd like you to uh, tell our audience how to find more information about you and your and uh, certainly your, your book, Mysterious Realities, but you also have a great website, right? Mastery. Dreams.com is the website, my surname, the stuff that grows on trees, MarsDreams.com. You find I teach all over the place. I teach all over MarsDreams.com. I teach all over the planet. I also lead online courses for the Shift Network. And I have written, as you observe, Peter, many, many books. This is my favorite, of course. It's the new one. I'm the proud parent. And it throws you in the deep end. But in some of the other books, you'll get more technique, more practice, more theory. Yes, but I love this book so much. And uh, I, I hope we can uh, talk about it some more uh, in, another, in another show. So thank you, Robert Moss, for being a guest on Energy Stew. I'm so grateful to, be, to know you and to be exploring the reality that you present. Always a pleasure talking to you, Peter. Always happy to be in your stew. <laughs> you, right. And this is Peter Roth, the host of Energy Stew. I can be reached at Peter at Heart River, H-E-A-R-T, river.org. I'd love to hear from you and thanks so much for listening.